morning. I want to welcome you to Sunrise Church. My name is Steve Garcia. I'm the lead pastor here, and a special welcome to our Sunrise family. We're so thankful for your commitment to this church. I want to say a special welcome to those who are watching online. Thank you for leaning in with us today. And if this is your first time with us at Sunrise, a special welcome to you as well. Today, we're starting a new message series through the Old Testament book of Ruth. It's a powerful story filled with love and loss, pain and hope. And all it takes is a quick read through of Ruth to discover that it's very different culturally compared to how we live today, which will tempt many of us to quickly dismiss it as something that can't apply to our lives. And this is generally a problem that we have with the Bible. It was written so long ago. It was written to, to ancient people. It doesn't apply to my culture today. Well, let me ask you this. Is love cultural? Like when you look at another nation in the world, you think, oh, those people don't know how to love. How about loss? Has any, has any person over the course of history experienced loss? What about pain? What about hope? Is hope cultural? You know, we live in such advanced times today, especially when it comes to technology. Smartphones, artificial intelligence, self-driving cars, social media. You know, but despite all of our advancements in education and globalization and technology, in 2023, the Surgeon General declared a new epidemic in the United States. You know what it is? Loneliness. Despite being the most connected generation in the history of civilization, most Americans still feel invisible. Most people are yearning for deeply significant relationships they don't have. Most people want to know and be known. And that's the beauty of the Bible, is that it speaks to the core issues of the human experience. See, times change, trends change, technology changes. But the human heart has remained remarkably the same throughout history. And the book of Ruth speaks into these powerful core experiences. And we're going to see how a sovereign God weaves through it all. And the same God that worked in the life of Ruth is the same God that can be at work in you. And so I pray that over the next four weeks, God would do a powerful work in your heart as we journey together. And so with that, let's start part one of Redemption. If you have a Bible or a device with a Bible on it, make your way to the Old Testament book of Ruth. Each week we're going to read through a different chapter. So today we're starting in chapter 1, verse 1. Read along with me. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And so a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, they went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. Now, if you've ever read the Bible before, you've likely come across passages like this. Hard to pronounce names and tribes and locations. And typically, we, we blast right past these so that we can get to the good stuff. But packed into these two verses are, are, are some information that actually has massive implications even on our lives today. You know, at, at first read, it just seems like this, this is a classic immigration story. Some, somebody left their country uh, because of a famine, and, you know, that, that, that kind of thing happens all the time. In fact, millions of people in our world right now are facing a famine in places like northern Nigeria and Somalia and, and Yemen. Millions others, uh, they immigrate from their country due to war or joblessness or an oppressive government regime. Uh, but at the outset of the Book of Ruth, that's not what's going on here. The famine in Israel is actually directly tied to a promise that God made his people. Long before Elimelech ever moved his family to a new country, God spoke these words to the Israelite people. It's found in Deuteronomy 11, verse 13. He said, so if you faithfully obey the commands I'm giving you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will send rain on your land in its season, both autumn and spring rains, so that you may gather in your grain new wine and olive oil. 
I will provide grass in the fields for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. God made a, a promise to his people that if, if they kept him first, he would meet all their needs. They would never have to worry. They just needed to stay in the land and trust him. But he also gave them a warning. Verse 16, be careful or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you and he will shut up the heavens so that it will not rain and the ground will yield no produce and you will soon perish from the good land the Lord is giving you. So the promise was simple. You keep God first, he'll take care of your needs. If you start worshiping idols, a famine will come. What happens at the beginning of Ruth? There's a famine. What does that tell you? That there was idolatry. And so if, if the, the right response would be repent from worshiping these false gods and God will take care of you. But instead, our guy at the beginning, Elimelech, he decides to move his family to a new land. Most scholars believe that Elimelech was an idol worshiper. He didn't want to give that up. So instead of changing his ways, he changed locations. A lot of us do the same thing too, don't we? We think that running is going to solve the problem. And it's a reminder, you could run as far as you want, but you can't run from you. No matter how far you go, you're still there. And at some point in time, you got to actually deal with the problem. So it, where did he take his family off to? It says in Ruth 1, verse 2, and they went to Moab and lived there. Hey, I heard of Moab. Isn't that a a place in Utah with great hiking? Yeah. Different Moab. <laughs> the Moab in the Bible is in what is now the country of Jordan. And he, here's how the Moabites came to be. I'm about to tell you something that they, <clears throat> they don't teach the little kids in Sunday school. Okay? There's a guy named Lot, and he and his family escaped the famously wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah that, that God destroyed. And after he got out, this happened. I need to warn you. This is pretty dark. Genesis 19, verse 30. Lot and his two daughters left Zor and settled in the mountains, for he was afraid to stay in Zor. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. One day, the older daughter said to the younger, Our father is old, and there's no man around here to give us children, as is the custom all over the earth. Let's get our father to drink wine and then sleep with him and preserve our family line through our father. That night, they got their father to drink wine and the older daughter went in and slept with him. He was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. First of all, ew. Second of all, I've got questions. They're the same questions you have. I don't know the answer to them. But this much we know is that the daughter of Lot slept with her father when he was drunk. And then the next night, the younger sister did the same thing. Verse 36. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son, and she named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites of today. The younger daughter also had a son. She named him Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites of today. Drunken, incestuous, sexual assault. Sure, I'm glad I came to church today. You know, good, good weekend pick-me-up, right? Listen, I, I wish this stuff wasn't in the Bible, but God didn't choose to sanitize it. He kept it in there. This is real. This is real stuff. And the Moabites became bitter enemies of Israel. Where did Elimelech take his family? To Moab, to this very place. He, he was already outside of God's promises and then went to ally himself with a bitter enemy. And so he took off with his family, and, and often we forge our, our plans with the, with the best of intentions, but our plans don't always work out the way we thought. Verse 3, now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. Pain has a funny way of changing our plans. Now Naomi is left to raise her sons as a widow. This should have been the first indication, I need to go back home. But her sons had a different idea. Verse 4, they married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. This was also a big deal because God commanded them to not do the very thing they did. Again, 
way back before any of this happened, God said this to the Israelite people, again, in Deuteronomy 23, 6. As long as you live, you must never promote the welfare and prosperity of the Ammonites or the Moabites. God said, do not ally, yourself, ally yourselves with them because they will lead you into further idolatry. And certainly don't marry them. Yet what does Naomi's sons do? The very thing God told them not to do. You see, once you make one bad choice, it becomes easier to make the next bad choice. Well, I already made a mistake. What's another one? It usually starts when you're in the wrong place. Because when you're in the wrong place, you meet the wrong people. When you ally yourself with the wrong people, you make the wrong choices. And that's precisely what was going on with Naomi and her sons. Verse 4. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. How much tragedy can one person endure? Naomi experienced a quadruple loss. She lost her home country. She lost her husband. She lost her older son. She lost her younger son. And on top of all this, the hits just kept on coming because in that culture at that time, to be a woman without any husband or sons put you in the most vulnerable class of society. See, men were the providers. They were the hunters. They were the soldiers, the defenders. And for a woman to not have a man in her life left her totally vulnerable. Naomi had no husband, no sons, and she was legally in charge of these two women who married her sons. This was a very desperate situation for her. But hope was on the horizon. Verse 6. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Now, we don't know what was going through Naomi's heart if she was already considering coming back home, but all of a sudden, this news came, and don't underestimate how powerful this is. Because even in the darkest of places, the news of God can still reach our ears. And this is all that Naomi needed as confirmation. It's time to go back to God. And I think a lot of us can relate because many of us get on a path that leads away from Jesus. We make some bad choices, and before we realize it, we're already far away. That's a bad decision. So what's the next best decision? The next best decision is to come back to him. And as we go throughout this chapter, I want to pause along the way and extract some lessons we could apply to our lives today. And so here's the first one. Number one, with Jesus, it's always the right time to return. It doesn't matter how far away you've gotten. You need to understand something about Jesus. He is the God of grace and he is always ready to receive us back. With Jesus, it's always the right time to return. <laughs> you know, a number of years ago, <clears throat> my wife and I were coming back from a mission trip in Asia, and because we were flying through the Netherlands, we decided to, to stay there for a couple of days and take in the sights and sounds of the country before we headed back home. And so on one of the days, we rented bicycles and decided to go out and explore the beautiful European countryside. And where we were biking was so far outside of cell phone coverage, and so the only way to really know where you were going is on this trail, every couple of miles was a trail marker just to confirm you that you were still on the right path. And so we drove for about two hours, and we reached our destination, had a great time, snapped a few pictures, and decided it was time to come back. So my wife had the idea, why don't we just go back the exact same way we came? But I had a much better idea. <laughs> I thought... By looking at the map, there's an alternative way back home. Then we can get totally different scenery so we're not just seeing the same things. My wife thought this was a bad idea. I was able to convince her this was the best idea ever. So we got on our bikes and off we went. And as we're riding, probably about 30 minutes in, she's saying, yeah, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel right. I'm like, come on, look, there's a trail marker. We're still headed in the right direction. What could possibly go wrong? And so we're, we're driving and driving, and, and everything is fine, and then the trail literally ends. <laughs> I mean, as in there is no more places to go. At this point, we've probably been riding for about 90 minutes. 
So we're like, okay, this isn't good news, okay? Look, I'm a pastor for a reason. I, I never claim to be a tour guide, but uh, <laughs> nobody speaks English anywhere. So my wife finally finds like the one guy in all of Netherlands who speaks a little bit of broken English. And he asks us where we're trying to go. And when we told him, he laughed at us. That's never a good sign, especially when you're in a foreign country. He literally laughed at us. And then he pointed at the road. And he said, if, if, if you drive this road and just take it back, you could probably get to where you're going in about four or five hours. I had drifted a slightly off course. You know, and the whole time my wife was saying, why don't we just go back? But the thing for me is, I don't want to have to turn around and go back another 90 minutes just to get back to the point where we start over. You know, and, and for a lot of us, when we go down the road, we want to see it through to the end. But there comes a point in time where we have to admit to ourselves, the place I thought I was going, I'm never going to get there. It's time to cut our losses and go back the way we came. And that's exactly what was happening with Naomi. She was cutting her losses. She, we got to go back. And when it comes to Jesus, some of us have gone down the wrong road. And we just keep thinking, ah, 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 if I just go a little bit further, then I'll be okay. But you know, what's interesting is that by all indications, it didn't seem that Elimelech was planning on staying in Moab very long. We read it earlier. If you blinked, you missed it. Look at verse 1 again of Ruth 1. It says, so a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Maybe the rationale was, hey, we'll just go over here for a little bit till the famine blows over, and then we'll go back. Well, a little while turned into more than 10 years. And a lot of us can relate. We think, I I'm just going to go down this road for a little bit. I'm going to start going on a couple of dates with this person, even though I know they are very bad for me. We don't share the same faith system. And a couple of dates turned into a couple of years, now you've got some kids together and you can't stand one another. Or some people said, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to visit this website for just a, a few minutes. A few minutes turns into a few hours. A few hours turns into an addiction. And now you're trapped in cycles of shame and secrecy. Or, you know, a, a friend of mine has told me about this can't-miss investment opportunity. All I have to do is put some of my money up front, and in a few weeks, I'll start seeing profits. Well, a few weeks turns into a few months, and you just keep putting more and more money up, and the profits never come, and you got to decide, do I stay the course, hoping this thing turns around, or do I just cut my losses before the debt mounts even higher? All of those scenarios are things that took place in the lives of people in this church. And the thing that they all had in common was not a single one of them ever prayed before they made any of these choices. They never asked God what his desire for their life was. They never sought out good advice from godly people. They thought they were in control. They planned to just do it for a little while. And before long, they looked up and they were so far down the wrong road, they could barely even see where they came from. When you make a bad decision, what's the next best decision? The next best decision is come back. And with Jesus, it's always the right time to return. Listen to these words of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah in 55. He says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he is near. Let the wicked one abandon his way and the sinful one his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. So he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will freely forgive. This may be a moment right now for those of you who have wandered said, I got to make a change. The decisions that got you in trouble are not going to be the same decisions that get you out of trouble. You got to do something different. Come back to the Lord. Number one it says that with Jesus, it's always the right time to Return, And so that's what Naomi and her daughters were doing. And so they set out on the road back to the land that God promised them. But a couple of miles into the journey, Naomi started changing her tune. This is verse 8. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. Naomi was officially releasing her daughters from their obligation. 
Why she did this after they started the journey, I don't know. Maybe she started feeling uh, discouraged by the fact that when she got back home, she would see all of her old family and friends, and she's coming back with no husband, no kids, but only a couple of Moabite women. Maybe she was embarrassed by that. Or maybe she thought her two daughters-in-law were just in it out of obligation, but not really in it because they wanted to be. Or maybe in her grief, she was just pushing away the only family she had left. We don't know. But she began the process of releasing them, and she said, may the Lord show you kindness. Our English language is pretty limited with this word because this is actually a really important word in Hebrew. The word is chesed. To say it correctly, it's almost like you're clearing your throat. Chesed. And here's what that word means. It's an intensely loyal and faithful love that does not benefit the one offering it, but the one receiving it. You see how kindness is a bit limited in that term. And what Naomi was praying over her daughters was, was may God's intense, loyal, faithful love guide you and guard you. She would have no idea how that prayer would be answered. More on that in weeks to come. Verse 9. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. There was a genuine relationship there. They, they were crying. They didn't want to leave her. And both girls, they, they affirmed, we're going to be a part of your people. We'll do it. Verse 11, but Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight, and then gave birth to sons. Would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it's more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Naomi just broke it down. Said, there, there's no hope for your future in Israel, girls. See, back in that day, the, the ancient law was that if a woman, if a woman's husband died, then, then his brother or closest relative was supposed to take her in and, and take care of her. She's saying, I don't have family like that. And even if I did, and I got married right away and had kids right away, what, are you going to wait around for 20 years until these kids are ready to marry? It doesn't make sense. Your best bet is to just go back home. She was releasing them. Verse 14, at this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. Orpah made her decision. Naomi's case made a lot of sense. And so she kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, said goodbye to her sister, and went back to Moab. And what became of her life? She ended up becoming one of the most powerful women in the television industry, Oprah Winfrey. No, she... <laughs> Doesn't even make sense, but... <clears throat> in all seriousness, anyone want to guess where Oprah got her name? From this very story. From Orpah. True story, somebody in her family spelled the name wrong on the birth certificate, and she went with Oprah ever since. The Orpah of the Bible made her decision. She had it back, and we don't know what ever became of her life. But Ruth hung on to Naomi and would not let go. Verse 16, Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. What a powerful picture of love. Isn't that incredible? And, and Ruth saw something in Naomi's God, and she was willing to walk away from it all and say, we're gonna follow this God together. And with that, Naomi did something that nobody else in this entire story did. And that leads us to our second life lesson. Stop chasing the provision and start chasing the provider. Think about it. Every person in this narrative so far was chasing after provision. The whole reason why Elimelech left Israel in the first place was because Moab had the provision of food. Why did the boys marry Moabite women? Because the land had provided them beautiful women they could have right there. Why was Naomi heading back to her home country? Because now there was the provision of food in Israel. 
Why did Orpah head back to her land? Because that was the place that provided her the best opportunity to find a husband. Everyone was chasing after provision except Ruth. Ruth was saying, I'm going to go back with you even though I don't know where we're going to live, how we're going to eat. People will probably hate me because of my ethnicity. Uh, We don't know what the future is going to hold. All we know is that I have no chance at ever getting married or having kids, but I'm going to follow your God to be my God and just trust in him all the way. What a powerful example. You know, this is something that's very important for you and I to understand. Listen very carefully. You are not a body who has a soul. You are a soul who has a body. Physical provision is necessary, but spiritual provision is a priority. More than a 1,000 years later, Jesus himself would teach on this very notion when he said these words in Matthew 6, 31. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus said, make him a priority in your life and all the other things will come along the way. You are not a body that has a soul. You are a soul that has a body. And the most important thing is get the spiritual right and the physical will follow. This is the same promise God made to his people in the land. Prioritize God. Your needs will be taken care of. You step outside of that, there's going to be a problem. And this was the very thing that, that God promised And for so many of us, we miss this. I mean, how many of us, when faced with the choice between provision or provider, would choose the provider? We actually see this happen in churches all the time. For example, people like, okay, this church over here, they've got this great young adult singles thing, so I'm going to go over there, but I really like the kids' ministry at this church, but the music at that church is excellent. I kind of like the preacher man over here at this church, but this church right here has the absolute best communion bread. Like, I'm going there every first Sunday of the month just to get the bread, you know? And rather than rooting in and investing in people and and supporting the mission, we just keep chasing after after whatever it is that, that meets my needs. And there comes a point in time where maybe God's just saying to your heart, hey, when are you gonna start chasing after me? How about all of us take a page from Ruth's book? May every one of us, men and women alike, young and old alike, seasoned Christians to those who are still at the starting line, may we all follow Ruth's example and let's chase the provider, not just the provision. And so Ruth and Naomi stayed together following after God. Isn't it ironic that the one person who got this was a foreigner whose Hebrew husband wasn't even following God and sometimes the people who get you there are not the people who are going to still be with you as you start growing. And that's what was happening with her. Verse 19 of Ruth 1. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. That one sentence doesn't really do justice to the journey. So let me show you a little bit about where they came. Here's, here's a map. So you see down there in the, in the lower right uh, corner of the map is Moab. That's southern Jordan today. And they would have had to travel north past the Dead Sea, over the dreaded Jericho Pass, a place so dangerous because of pack animals and and marauders hiding out in in a culture where everyone did whatever the heck they wanted to do, and two uh, women all by themselves, and then they would head west to Jerusalem. That's about 75 miles, and so if you've got really good footwear, you can make the journey in 27 hours, if you're walking at a brisk pace. Who here wants to go hiking for 27 hours? They didn't have that kind of gear. It would have taken them longer. And on top of all that, I've been to the Dead Sea. I was there a couple years ago. Here's a picture of me at the Dead Sea. This is literally the lowest place on earth. It's more than 1,400 feet below the sea level, which meant for Ruth and Naomi, they were traveling all the way down to the Dead Sea, which meant they would have had to go back up to Bethlehem. That's 30 miles of going up in an elevation climb of more than 2,000 feet. This was no easy journey, but they did it. Verse 19, 
When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Ever been on social media and come across somebody that you used to hang out with in your past? You go, oh man, they look old. <laughs> and the thought occurs to you, I wonder how I look to them. <laughs> People saw Naomi, they're like, wait, is that Naomi? Naomi likely did not age well. All of the years of stress and loss probably did not, did not help her. Not only that, but she was coming off a brutal journey. And listen to what she says in verse 20. Don't, don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Very interesting words. Because remember why she left in the first place? A famine. She went away empty so that she could get full. But as she looked back on her life, realized I was full before I left. I had a, I had a husband, children. I was living under the covenant promises of God. See, a lot of times we go chasing after greener pastures, and when that's on a place that leads away from God, we discover that we are emptier after chasing it than when we even began in the first place. And Naomi started to realize this. She said, why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Lord Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Naomi realized she had done things her way long enough and had left her empty. But believe it or not, this is actually a very healthy place to be. Because when you're in the right place, but you're empty, and realizing that your, your utter state of poverty before the Lord, that's when your redemption can begin. When you start to realize, I don't have the strength to do it on my own. I messed up, I'm beat up, I need God. That's a good place to be. And it leads us to our third life lesson, and that is this. Hope begins with humility. The opposite of humility is pride. Pride is what keeps us on the wrong road. But humility is when we own our mistakes, own our failures, own our bad choices, and come to the Lord and say, I'm here now. I can't do this on my own. Can you help me? That's what Naomi did. She brought herself back to the right place even though she was empty. But you might say, I, I don't see a whole lot of hope here. I see a woman who's petitioning for a name change. Hey, everyone, call me bitter. Don't call me by my first name. I am now bitter. Where's the hope in that? Let's read the very last verse of Ruth 1. It says, So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem, as the barley harvest was beginning. At the exact moment they arrived, something new was stirring. That is not an accident. Now, you and I, we don't live in an agricultural society today. If we want food, we don't even have to leave the house to get it. DoorDash will bring it right to us. Right? But there was a time in our not-too-distant history we had to work for our food. And people had to go through the hard labor of tilling the soil and planting the seeds and working and watering the land. But the reward of all this toil was the harvest, the gathering of the crops, the celebration of, of the return on investment. And the exact moment that they came back, it was the harvest. Isn't that interesting? When Naomi left the land, it was a famine. When she returned to the land, it was a harvest. And God was about to start a new harvest in her heart. But it began with humbling herself and coming back. More than a thousand years later, Jesus would say these words in Matthew 23, 12. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will will be exalted. If you live for yourself, humility will come not by choice. But if you choose humility, God will lift you up. Humility is not justifying bad behavior, making excuses. Humility is not quickly turning the page and just moving on. Humility is not trying to spin some positive outcome out of disastrously bad choices. Humility is saying, I messed up. That's on me. But I'm here now, God. Can you make something out of the mess of my life? 
And if I believe that what the Bible says is true, that God in his own way and in his own time is going to lift me back up. And I wonder how many of us today have been wandering away from Jesus. And in pride, you're, you're, you're just keeping, keep going further and further away. And what God is telling you today right now is to humble yourself before him. And when you do so, that's when hope is born. That's what makes it possible for your redemption. There's some of you who say, I, I have... I'm not returning back to the Lord because I haven't even been on the road with the Lord ever. I've never had a relationship with Jesus. And maybe for you, you're looking at the sum total of your life and you're like, I already see what happens when I exalt me. I've already seen what happens when I keep doing things my way. It's not working. I need something different. And Jesus, today I'm asking that you would come into my life and change me. I'm believing that I can't do this my way anymore. And if that's you, I want to help you take that step today. I want to help you begin a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you've never intentionally invited him into your life, I want to help you do that by leading you in a simple prayer that you could repeat after me. These are just empty chants unless you believe them by faith. It's just a prayer of, of turning your heart to him and believing in faith that Jesus died in your place, committing to follow him. So I want to ask everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you want to invite Christ into your life, I want you to repeat these words after me in the silence of your heart. Jesus, I place my trust in you. You can pray that right up to him. Jesus, I place my trust in you. I can't do this on my own. So today, I'm giving you my life. I believe you died in my place. And I'm asking that you forgive me of my many sins. I'm a sinner. But Jesus, you're my Savior. Will you forgive me? And will you change me so I don't keep making the same choices, but choose to live a new life, a life that honors you? In Jesus' name I ask, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today, I want to encourage you to let us know here's an easy way to do it. On your program when you came in is a perforated card. Just fill that out, tear that off, and there's a little box on there that says, I pray to receive Christ. In a moment, the usher's gonna come through and collect today's offering. Just drop it right in there. We'll follow up with you and help you understand what it means to, to cross this line of faith and what the future looks like now and help you grow. Maybe you've already prayed to receive Jesus, but you wanna take your next step. You're not really moving anywhere. Here's an easy way to do so. Text NEXT to 909-281-7797. One of our staff people will exchange a few messages with you and help you take that next step, joining a small group or serving, or maybe you need somebody to talk to. Text NEXT to 909-281-7797, or in our lobby is a next step table, and you could have a face-to-face -face conversation with someone today. So what happened when Naomi and Ruth arrived in Bethlehem? How did they survive? What new surprises came their way? We're going to talk about that next week. You're not going to want to miss it. You know, last time we went through a book of the Bible, I said that to someone. They said, I, I can't wait to hear what happens. I'll be back next week. And I told them, you know, it's written in the Bible. <laughs> you could actually read ahead. You, you don't need to wait on me. And so I encourage you, read ahead. Get it in your heart. Be ready. And, and next Sunday is Mother's Day. So if you are a mother or have a mother or desire to be a mother or fulfill some kind of motherly role, you gotta come back next week. Invite somebody to come with you. You're gonna hear an encouraging message that's gonna be honoring to women. Until then, let's remember this. With Jesus, it's always the right time to return. Stop chasing the provision and start chasing the provider. And hope begins with humility. Even when we've gone down the wrong road, the God of grace is ready to receive us back and begin our redemption. You believe it? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you for...
giving us these, these true stories from your word that can help us see ourselves in them. And I pray for anybody in here who has been heading in the wrong direction that today would be the day they hit a U-turn and come back to you in humility, ready to, to lay their lives back down at your feet. God, for anyone who's never trusted in you, I pray they would not leave this place today until they have that assurance that they are one of your children. And Father, as we prepare to take these tithes and offerings, I pray that these would be given with glad and sincere hearts and that you would take this money and multiply it so that we can make your name great through this whole world. We thank you for being the God of redemption. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And if you believe it in your heart, then somebody say, amen. amen.